Father, we need your help today. Lord, um, I'm thankful that, Lord, you're a sovereign God. You're in control. Lord, our lives are in your hands. Lord, our times are in your hands. Uh, Father, I pray that, Lord, this morning uh, you would anoint me. Father, I need your help as I preach and teach the Word of God this morning. I pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord, to be excited about what you have for us. God, I pray that our minds and our ears would be open to receive the Word of God. Help us, Lord, to receive, as James said, the engrafted Word with meekness. Uh, Father, I pray, uh, Lord, once again, that you'd be with those amongst us, Lord, who, who have experienced sorrow, who are not able to be here because of illness, because of physical difficulties. Father, I pray that you might make yourself very real to them this morning. God, that they might know you and sense your presence. So, Lord, bless our time. May it be profitable, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. We know that certainly at least one reason John is writing was given us in the very first chapter, verse 4, where he, he said this, These things write we to you that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. And the first thing, one of the first things he tells us here in this epistle is that we can have fellowship with the Father and with the Son through the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to show us that there are certain conditions, if you will, that are necessary in order for us to maintain the fellowship with God that we need and that we should desire. And we could kind of sum that all up with one word, righteousness. Righteousness. God is light. We must walk in that light, right? He's told us that. That is righteousness. We are to keep his commandments. Like he said in chapter 2, verse 4, he that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. So we're to keep his commandments. That's righteousness. We are to love the brethren. That is manifesting righteousness. Then, of course, he's given us kind of the negative manifestation, if you will, of righteousness by telling us in uh, verse 15 of chapter 2 to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And then... As we looked at last week, the last half of chapter 2, if you will, where he kind of gets into the doctrinal aspect of who Jesus Christ is. Our doctrine has to be correct regarding Jesus Christ because without him there is no righteousness at all, right? Ours is as filthy rags. That's what Isaiah said. So without Christ there is no righteousness. So righteousness is that thing that is essential to fellowship with God. And uh, when we talk of righteousness, we're talking about a kind of life that comes from the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? There are plenty of good and moral people in this world today who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So we're talking about the kind of righteousness that comes from within, that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. In... Uh, John uh, chapter 2 verse 29 that we looked at last week, he argues that if we are born of God, then there ought to be a certain quality of life. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Now it would make perfect sense to go right from 229 into chapter 3 and verse 4. We could say that. We could read 29. If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Verse 4, whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And we could go on, and it would make perfect sense. But he has mentioned, John has mentioned being born of God here, and it's like he cannot stop there with that. That's not quite enough. And so he comes to a point here, it seems, where he must kind of stop and contemplate on what God has done for us, on who and what we are as believers. So let us pause with him and read chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and 3, where he says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, 
Uh, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. So the title of the message this morning is, What Manner of Love Is This? What manner of love is this? I'll tell you what manner of love it is. Number one, it's a manner of love that guarantees us a position as a child of God. Amen? It is a manner of love that guarantees us a position as a son of God or a child of God. Uh, uh, excuse me, of God. According to what John said here, we are the sons of God. And it's not just a label that we put on ourselves as Christians. We are, we are children of God. You ever, you ever get a hold of that? You ever stop and kind of contemplate on that, that we are children of God? Amen? Are you excited about that this morning? Enthusiastic about that at all? We are children of God. You know, this was God's intention from the very beginning, obviously, but given the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden and, uh, you know, the track history, if you will, of man since then, it really is... Uh, almost inconceivable that God would continue to deal with us and allow us to be his children. I mean, it is. You think about, what we, you think about who we are and what we are outside of Christ. And we, I like what one commentator said. He said this, We become children of God when God the Father of his own will takes the seed of his word, plants it within the heart, causing it to unite with the ovum of saving faith which together begin to grow. Isn't that good? <laughs> we are children because God has chosen us to be the recipients of his love. And uh, God's love is unique. And, uh, John really kind of indicates that by his statement. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. It is a unique love. <laughs> what kind of love does this? I mean, you know, what to, where did this kind of love come from? Well, it came from the heart of God, amen? It came from the heart of God. And, and John is asking us here to contemplate the manner of love, this position that we are in, our relationship uh, to God. It is a unique position made possible, as I mentioned earlier, by what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. You know, people like to talk about the universal uh, uh, fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of, of man. Uh, but it really is only universal in the sense that we were all created by him. That's where it stops. That's where it stops. As a son of God birthed by the Holy Spirit, we have come into a special relationship with him. There is nothing universal about that. You need to be born again. Amen? You need to be born again to be a child of God. And, and John later in this chapter is going to differentiate between the children of God and the children of the devil. In fact, Jesus did that himself when he addressed the self-righteous uh, Pharisees. John chapter 8 uh, verse uh, 44. He said, he pointed his finger at him. I, 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 I think he did. I don't know if he did. He, he said, you're of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. That's not very politically correct. Not very politically correct, but it's truth, amen? And John does the same thing. Of course, John's the one that recorded that in the Gospel of John, so he knew all about it. You are of your father the devil, the lust of your father will do. Again, it's only those who are born again that can truly lay claim to what John is telling us here. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Only those who are born again can, can lay claim to that. Look at... Um, Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And look about verse 15. Romans chapter 8 verse 15. We read this. Paul says, You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of of God. He goes on to say, if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. <laughs> we got some good things ahead of us. Uh, so apart from, the, apart from the new birth, you are outside of the life of God and you are dead in your trespasses and sins. You know what? If you're here this morning and you have never been born again, the Bible says you're dead in your trespasses and sins and you're on your way to hell. That's what the scriptures teach us. You have none of the privileges of, of uh, sonship that John's talking about here. 
Peter says in uh, 1 Peter chapter, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4, he says, Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. The vine and the branches of John chapter 15 are another good example. They describe the organic relationship, if you will, that we have, uh, that we have with the Lord and that we share this nature. Uh, we share in the nature of God. Let me put it like that. As children, we are members of the family of God. You know, I love that little chorus that we sing once in a while. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Amen. Yeah. Are you glad about that this morning? Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Ephesians chapter 2. Let me go there. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says this in uh, about verse 12. He goes uh, that in, at that time you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Then we go over to verse 19. It says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Listen. Christian is not just someone who's trying to, trying to you know, live a good life, trying to be a, a, a little bit better, uh, trying to be a little bit nicer than somebody else, maybe uh, going through certain rituals, doing certain things. There's more to being a Christian than that. We are children of God. Have you got that this morning? <laughs> we, we can call ourselves a, a child of the king. We have received something of the very nature and life of God himself. We, are, we, are, we have been transformed. We are new creations. That's an amazing thing when you stop and think about it. It really is. John doesn't try to explain it. He just says, behold it. <laughs> he doesn't try to explain it. Behold what manner of love the Father has given. Again, it's like John takes a pause here and goes, man, this is, this is unbelievable. This is inconceivable. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us. Doesn't try to explain it, just says behold it. And he indicates too that the world doesn't understand it. It's the last part of the verse there. He says the world knows us not because it knew him not. The world doesn't understand it. And they don't understand you either, do they? They don't understand you because they don't understand Christ. Again, John recorded in his gospel, you know, he came unto his own, and his own received him not, right? Chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. So the world didn't know who he was. They refused to believe he, who he was. They, they refused to, to acknowledge him and, as a son of God. And, and uh, because of that, they're not going to know us either. They're not going to understand it. When we say we're a child of God, uh, they don't really understand what we're really talking about. Okay? They, they believe in that universal child of God thing. They don't understand the fact that we must be born again, that we partake of the very nature of God. It behooves us to act like that, too, as well. So they're not going to know us. They don't appreciate the fact. They don't understand the fact that we're called the sons of God. And, it, right, and, and in the end, at the end of the day, who cares, right? Who cares? We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Amen? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. Our position as sons of God... We read in Ephesians, gives us an inheritance, benefits and privileges and hope for the future. One commentator said this, we might be slighted by the world, but we've been selected by the Father. That's good stuff, ain't it? <laughs> we may be slighted by the world, but we've been selected by the Father. So listen, this behold, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. This manner of love is one that, that uh, guarantees us a position as a child of God. We ought to shout hallelujah to that. Amen. Number two, that was amen, that wasn't hallelujah. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Number two, this is a manner of love that promises us a supernatural potential. It promises us a supernatural potential. Notice what he says in verse 2. We are the, now we are the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. That's a supernatural potential that we have out there. 
And given what's going on in this old world today, I hope it comes sooner than later. So this statement right here reminds us once again the privilege we have to be called Christians, to be called a child of God. I, I, I'm, I, I'm re reminded that this life we live today is nothing compared to what we have ahead of us. In fact, let me go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. He said, uh, Paul said this, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now Richard Baxter, I believe he's one of the Puritans, if I'm not mistaken. He penned some words to him. goes like this. Lord, it belongs not to my care whether I die or live. To love and serve thee is my share, and this thy grace must give. If life be long, I'll be glad that I may long obey. Isn't that a different perspective? If life be long, I will be glad that I may long obey. Is that why you want to live long, so you can obey? <laughs> He says, if short, yet why should I be sad to soar to endless day? Christ leads me through no darker rooms than he went through before. He that into God's kingdom comes must enter by this door. Come, Lord, when grace has made me meet thy blessed face to see. For if thy work on earth be sweet, what will thy glory be? Then shall I end my sad complaints and weary sinful days. And join with the triumphant saints who sing Jehovah's praise. My knowledge of that life is small. The eye of faith is dim. But tis enough that Christ knows all. And I shall be with him. Amen. <laughs> you know, our ideas, I was, as I was studying this and, and thinking about these things, our ideas and our conception of our eternal future are really pretty puny. Don't you think? They're pretty puny. I think we have a hard time wrapping our minds, our finite minds, around what God has in store for us. It doesn't appear, uh, excuse me, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we'll be like him. We will be like him. I wonder if we can say those words that Richard Baxter penned from our hearts. Is that really our view of life? Do we really understand who we are and what we are in Jesus Christ? The manner of love that's been bestowed upon us. We need to put this truth into our context here on this earth. You know, we, we live, and I'm guilty, we live too much with the things that are immediately in front of us instead of putting everything into the context of our eternity and our destiny. Don't we? We live with the, in the context of what's, what's, what's this afternoon? What's tonight? What's tomorrow? Instead of thinking about the amazing things that God has planned for us for all of eternity. We're sons of God. Of course, we've dealt with that in the first point. We know exactly where we stand. Our position is that we are sons of God. Blow... Uh, Note that in verse 2 he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. This is not something that's future. He said, We're just as much the son of God now as we will be in eternity. Now are we the sons of God. We have already, again, dealt with that in the first point, so we won't belabor that. But Jones, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who I like to read, he said, We shall never be more the children of God than we are now. We are certainly as much a child of God now as we will be in glory. Aren't you glad that conduct does not determine our relationship because we're not we're far from perfect now our conduct may be may determine some of our fellowship but it doesn't determine our relationship we are sons of God if you have been born again this morning you're the son of God I don't care if you're not perfect prodigal son was as much a son of his father as the elder brother was a son of his father we all know that story so get a hold of this. We're sons of God. The, the last verse of the song we sometimes sing goes like this. 
Um, Though poor on this earth, oh, why should I care? Since glorious things for me God does prepare. Though trials abound, yet still I may sing all glory to God. I'm a child of the King. Amen? I'm a child of the King. John, we go back to John's Gospel. He said this in, in, in his Gospel in chapter 14. Again, a passage you're very, very uh, familiar with. He said in 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I'd have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's the hope we have. We are destined for that state of glory. We have a supernatural potential out there ahead of us. Listen, that is as much a part of our doctrine as is the fact we are forgiven by our sins because of the work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. We sometimes dwell on what's been done. We don't dwell on what's going to be happening. Romans, again, Paul said this in Romans chapter 8 and uh, verse, the last couple of verses of the chapter. He said, For I am persuaded neither death, life, angels, principalities, powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, depth, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is an absolute certainty. Amen? Amen. Mark it down. Mark it down. May not look like it now, John says. He says, it does not yet appear what we shall be. We could think about, again, what's going on in this world. And we go, it doesn't appear God's in control of this situation. <laughs> All right? He is. He is. We may not understand all of his purposes and all of what's going on behind the scenes, but rest assured, he is in control of this mess that we find ourselves in. John says, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that it is certain. And, and listen, what's the end game here? Romans 8, 29 says that we are to be conformed to his image, right? That's what, Paul, that's what John's talking about. We're going to be conformed to his image. Our sonship is a guarantee of our glorification. Again, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul said this. He said, uh, being confident of this very thing, which he has begun a good work, and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Our sonship is a guarantee of the fact that there is a glorification day coming sometime. This manner of love gives us a supernatural potential. And that will all be ushered in when he shall appear. Perhaps for some at the rapture, some at the second coming. And, and there's discussion, of course, about all the timing of all that. But the end, the fact that he's coming is what's important. Amen? Amen. The fact that he is coming is important. And that's when all this will take place. Second Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 3, he says... Um, excuse me, verse 13, he said, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwell righteousness. When he comes, these things will take place. We shall see him as he is. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse uh, 12. Even so, excuse me, verse 12. Uh, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, even as also I am known. We, see, we may see darkly now, but one day we're going to see face to face. Amen? There's going to be an amazing change. I love 1 Corinthians 15. I um, often will read some of this chapter at a graveside service. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Listen, it's a manner of love that guarantees us a position as a child of God. It's a manner of love that promises us a supernatural potential. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. <laughs> Woohoo! <All> right? <laughs> I 
I hope he comes before I get old and decrepit. Some of you are saying you're already halfway there. <laughs> Listen, we have a glorious hope. <laughs> and I believe, once again, John's kind of taking a pause here and he's going, man, this is something else. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Thirdly is this, and lastly, because you know I always have three points. <laughs> Wired into my brain. I try to get away from it, and it comes down to three points. I, I don't know how, I, most of the time. Here's the third point. Not only does this manner of love guarantee us a position as a son of God, not only does it uh, promise us a supernatural potential, but number three, it motivates us toward a practice of purity. It motivates us toward a practice of purity. Notice what he said in verse 3. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he's pure. And really that's the gist of the whole passage right here. If you get nothing else out of this this morning, get that. Everyone that has this hope purifies himself even as he's pure. Verse 2 leads to verse 3. And when we keep these verses in the context of all of 1 John, certainly what we've studied thus far, we see the real purpose of verse 2 is to prepare the way for verse 3. John's been writing about our walk. He's been talking about walking in the light. And here he says this truth, this hope, should move us toward a practice on this earth. Okay? One of purity, one of holiness. This ought to be our motivator. The fact that we have a hope out there in front of us ought to motivate us to live for him now. That's what John's saying. It's a great thing to dwell on what we have ahead of us as sons of God, but the fact is we're still here. Right? Amen. We're still here. As they say, as you've probably heard said many times, we cannot be so heavenly minded we're no earthly good. <laughs> Again, Jones said this, We should not be like Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration who said, Let's make three tabernacles and spend the rest of our lives here in the wonder and enjoyment of the Feast of Glory. No, we're not meant to do that. We're taken up to the mountain in order, we might in order that we might descend to the plain and do the work that's waiting for us. Yes, John is getting a glimpse of what lies ahead of us in glory, but now he gets back to reality and say, okay, here's what you got to do. Because you got this hope in you, you need to purify yourself. You need to practice it. Amen? That's what we're to be doing. We have this vision of glory in verse 2, and now what we need to do, we need to translate it into practice. The evidence that we understand the evidence that we understand what he's saying in verse 1 and 2 is borne out by what we do in verse 3. <laughs> really, that's the theme of James' epistle. What did James say? Faith without works is what? Dead. So we're not called here to purify ourselves in order that we may become something. We purify ourselves because we're already something. We're already something. We're a child of God, child of the King. That's the emphasis, really the whole message. Every man that has this hope in him, as he says there, purifies himself even as he's pure. If we really believe that we are children of God, if I believe and know that I'm destined for eternal glory in the presence of the Father, if I really believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return again, if I really believe he's, he's going to return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, if I believe he's coming to judge the world and destroy everything that is evil and vile, if I believe that I'm going to be with him in that glory, if I believe that I'm going to see him as he is, to be like him, what John's been telling us, if I really believe that my body's going to be glorified, that I'll be faultless and blameless and spend eternity in his presence, if I really believe all of that, then verse, the necessity of verse 3 must follow every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure what does it mean to purify ourselves well in negative sense it means to avoid sin obviously 
But in the positive sense, we ought to want to be like Jesus. Isn't that what John's been telling us? Keep the commandments, love your brethren. Don't love the things of the world. Reminds me of um, Paul's verses, his writing there in chapter, let's see, chapter 4 of Ephesians. He said this, he said, put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, be, excuse me, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So the point is, it's not enough just to put off sin and to avoid sin. Put on the new man, be renewed and go out and do some things. And he follows that up in Ephesians by several practical exhortations. We ought to be like Jesus. It's all about walking in the light. That's what John has been exhorting us to do in this epistle. Walk in the light. Let me just read a few verses here. 2 Corinthians uh, 7. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. He said this. He said, uh, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Hebrews chapter 6, verse uh, 11. Hebrews 6, 11. He said this, he said, We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope to the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And then one other passage in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, 1, he said this, If you be then risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things in the earth, for you are dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God, who then, or who, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Amen. Mortify there your, therefore your members, he says, which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Again, what is the end goal? According to Romans 8, chap chapter 8, verse 29, that we be conformed to his image. That we be conformed to his image. That ought to be what we are striving to do while we wait for the hope that John's talking about here. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that has this hope in him ought to be purifying himself. The end goal is that we be conformed to the image of Christ. You know, John indicated that at the end of chapter 2 in verse 28, he said, Abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. This is how you do it. This is how we have confidence and not be ashamed. We live, we practice purity to the best of our ability by the power of the Holy Spirit. We practice this purity. And that, you know, he puts on that little phrase on the end of that verse, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. You know, I thought, what does he mean there? Purify ourselves even as he is pure. Well, I'm not sure, but my answer would be positionally we are pure, Right? Positionally, we are pure. We are righteous. We don't always practice that. But positionally, by what Jesus Christ has done on the cross and by our faith in him, we are pure <laughs> through God's eyes. Isn't that good? Amen. Hope you want to be like Jesus this morning. And really, John is, is, is appealing to a sense of honor and a sense of gratitude here. Listen. This is what you got out ahead of you. Good night. The least you can do is out of a sense of gratitude and love for what he's done and for what we have and who we are because of him serving. Amen? Amen. That's the spirit of what John is telling us. In uh, Titus chapter 2, familiar passage. Verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11. He says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. 
What does this grace do that's appeared to all men? It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope. That's why we should live soberly and righteous and godly, because we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> In conclusion, let me just say this. I hope you understand John's logic. The logic here of what he has written. Listen, what manner of love God has given unto us that we can be called a child of God and that we're going to be like him one day when he appears. And because of that, what should our practice be today? on this earth. What should our practice be on this earth? I think about the words of God to Joshua. He said, only be strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to the law, all the law, law of the book of Moses. The book of the law, he goes on further to say, shall not depart out of thy mouth. Meditate day and night that thou may observe to do all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.